Hey, everybody. Um, I didn't do the intro today because we're not going to be able to do the live. Um, we double booked something. I'm just kidding, of course. It's April 1st. April Fool's. Alec Murdoch sentenced on April Fool's Day. Like anything else would happen in this case, right? Like anything else could happen. But before his sentencing, it all almost exploded as he was accused of lying once again, except this time objectively with proof that he was lying about money, about where it was and about not giving it back to the people that he stole from. But did it end up mattering? And how would they have used a polygraph against him anyways? This is court, right? You can't use polygraphs in court. You guys know that by now they're inadmissible. So how are they going to use it here? Well, it's federal court. And we happen to have a expert in federal court in our office and in our channel that we get to bring on whenever we talk about this stuff. It's my dad. How you doing? How you doing? Happy Good afternoon. Fool's Day. We're here. We're hanging out. And uh, I, I talked with my dad a little bit about this before the sentencing happened and before we knew it was all going to be moot eventually. But we'll talk about whether or not this argument actually did have an effect. My dad thinks it did have an effect on what the judge did. Um, and we'll talk about what that is a little bit later when we get to the sentence. But how does something like this happen, dad? Right? So they, they go in, there's a plea agreement. Everybody agrees. He's going to say, I did it. He tells them everything. He promises to tell the truth. Um, he gives a plea agreement with a polygraph and says at the state or at the, the federal government's sole discretion to evaluate my truth. So how do we end up getting in a position where the feds want to pull the plea agreement? Well, first off, that's standard language. Um, it, it's in almost every plea agreement. And, you know, you are, it's a bargain. A plea agreement is a bargain. And it's a, it's a contract that you're making with the government. And if you want to make the deal, you've got to agree to the government's terms. And the government's terms are always draconian. <laughs> They're always one-sided. And so this language is standard language. Um, and it's in the sole discretion of the government so that no one else has any discretion. And if anybody's surprised about that language or that Murdoch would sign off on that, um, A, it's standard. B, the guy had already admitted all this under oath in the state trial. So it, he, was, he lost no matter what. Like right. yeah, the yeah, guy literally nothing lost lose. no matter what. Yeah. yeah he what had nothing saying? to lose by signing. He had nothing to lose by signing this agreement. Yeah, just like you said. Yeah, it's just, why not? And here we go. So let's get into this. Ali R said, I disagree with Peter. He said they had proof they lied. Poly polygraphs aren't proof of anything. So usually that's true, Allie, and let's talk about that now. So one of the big questions around this that a lot of people ask me on Twitter and Instagram is, polygraph? How could they possibly use the polygraph? They can't use a polygraph. It's inadmissible, and it is inadmissible in most U.S. courts, if not all U.S. courts, state and federal. So how in this situation could the federal government have used the polygraph as proof that Alex Murdoch lied? Well, we've got to... Um... Take a look at a couple of things. Again, in this case, uh, it was not just the polygraph. They did have some other interviews and they've got some other evidence. Um, they went into a closed session with the judge and they disclosed to the judge some other evidence. And the, uh, the defense wanted everything disclosed, including the polygraph. And they said, no, we can't do it because this is an ongoing grand jury investigation. So we've got to keep it secret. So first off, it's not just the polygraph. They had some other stuff. We don't know what it is, but they did tell the judge what it is. Secondly, even though polygraphs are not evidence and not admissible in the evidence, you do sign an agreement in this case. He signed an agreement saying that the polygraph can be used by the government in their sole discretion to violate the plea agreement. So it's got nothing to do with evidentiary value. He stipulated and basically waived any objection he had to the government using it. The court, when it started this hearing, sent out three questions to the lawyers saying, look, the only thing I'm going to uh, look at is, did he agree to the polygraph? Did he take the polygraph? And did he fail the polygraph? And that's it. And sure enough, he agreed to the polygraph. He took the polygraph. And under the government's interpretation, which is the sole arbiter of whether or not he failed, he failed that polygraph. So, hey, you can waive rights in this country. And if you decide to waive your right, like in, in this agreement, he waived his right to appeal. 
you know, think about that. People think, oh, you always have a right to appeal. No, you don't. You can waive your right to appeal. So he waived his right to argue about the polygraph so he can come in to violate it. And th again, technically. And that's the point. Is it absolutely can be proof that he lied if he agrees that it's proof? And the government says that he lied. That's the point. Yeah. He basically agreed that they could use this. That's the point. Because you have to tell the truth. Well, how do you determine the truth polygraph? How do you determine if polygraph is right? The person giving it evaluates whether you're telling the truth or not based on the squiggle lines and all that stuff and the machine itself. And that's what he agreed to. So they could have used it in this situation as proof that he was lying. Now, whether or not it got there again, we'll talk about it. But um, Dad, when we talk about plea agreements like this and government and the, the feds pulling a, a plea agreement, how common is that? It's pretty rare because people don't like to violate plea agreements because normally they're getting such a benefit. They're very careful uh, about what they do. When, when I do plea agreement, and, you know, I've done hundreds and I've reviewed probably thousands of them. Um, you make sure that the language in there is something you can live with. You don't sign something you can't live with. Uh, and in this case, I am sure they went over with Myrna. Look, you can live with a polygraph, right? You can live with telling the truth, right? Yeah, sure. Of course, you know, he's got oh, a history yeah. of lying. Yeah. They'll figure out eventually that the guy just is not capable of telling the truth. But I'm talking about it more but, from the prosecutor's point of view. Like when you do this and then you pull it and they lie, A, it could surprise you. B, you could know this person's going to lie or you could know that you're going to end up pulling this plea agreement at the end, especially when it's a situation like this, where you can still use what you found out against him, which they could have in this case. Um, but that's not why they do it, right? I mean, the, most federal prosecutors are well thought out. They put together a plea agreement. They expect it to work. They expect it to go through. So it is unusual right. for them to do this and pull it. They don't like to pull the wool over people's eyes. Judges would frown upon it if one after the next, the government was like, aha, they signed this and we're going to say they lied under the polygraph. It's our sole discretion. So there is some protection with federal judges, right? Not letting prosecutors do this. Oh, sure. Because, you know, who wants to waste time? I mean, you know, federal courts are busy. They don't have the time to sit around and waste time with, with, with stuff like this. The only time that I've ever seen a prosecutor give a polygraph, frankly, is when the prosecutor knew before he gave the polygraph that the guy was going to fail. Yeah. Uh, I, I've never seen them give one just in case. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, they give it because they know this guy's going to fail and there's a problem. Uh, otherwise, it's a waste of time and money for them to sign a plea agreement they know is going to be violated. Francis asked, can a polygraph be tampered with? Of course, anything can be tampered with. But in well, this situation, it, it, when you're saying it's at the sole discretion of somebody, it's going to be tough to make that argument, which the defense kind of did. Well, the, the tampered, the word tampered is, you, you got to define that first. Can a polygraph examiner manipulate the manipulate, polygraph? Yeah. yeah, that's a better word, manipulate. Um, yeah, they're not going to like draw a line where there isn't a line, uh, but... They, they do know how to answer or, or ask questions that give certain responses. Because remember, polygraphs don't say you're lying. What they say is it indicates deception. That's the, the polygraph, the polygrapher's word. It indicates deception. And that means that something they answered made the line go up and down a little bit like it shouldn't. So you can manipulate it. A, polygraph, a bad polygraph examiner can manipulate the answers. And that's why you've got to be careful. And in the, you know, the, the defense did argue that. Yeah. And, and so apparently it was about this $6 million that are still missing and they still think is out there. But at the end of the day, based on the plea agreement, which I think we reviewed together and you reviewed it again now before this video, it didn't matter what he lied about, right? Right. And another thing besides the money, they think there's another lawyer involved. Right. But I'm, my point so, yeah. is it doesn't really matter what he lied about. If he lied, they could pull the plea agreement. Yes. So what were That's some of the idea. arguments each side made as far as the prosecutor wanted to pull the plea agreement and the defense arguing that this was kind of hogwash and some weird facts and stuff happened before the polygraph uh, exam even started with Alec Murdoch and, and the, uh, the government? Well, the, the defense argued multiple things. One thing they argued is it didn't follow the standard procedures. There's a national association that has procedures. It didn't follow the standard procedures. He also um, didn't ask about the murder. For some reason, they wanted him to because Murnau wanted him to. Uh, during the conversation, the polygrapher said, hey, I know you didn't murder your wife. That's what he said to the guy. I know you, I mean, you didn't murder him. You didn't commit these murders. Uh, and therefore, you know, I, I, I know you're innocent of those murders. 
All right. Basically, he was trying to get his. We don't need to drop the M word so quite so many times. So just okay. we trying to just we get All it. All right. All right. So basically, he was trying to gain his company. He was trying yeah. to make him comfortable in the situation, so that he thought the polygrapher was on his side and was a friend mm -hmm. while he asked these questions. So he'd be calmer, and, and his reactions would be more dramatic when he was uh, being deceptive. So he, they do this. It, that's very common. During the course of that conversation, um, Mordahl asked him to ask him questions about that. Well, he can't ask him questions about that. Number one, it wasn't the purpose of the polygraph. And number two, you can only ask certain what they call significant questions. If you ask too many significant questions, it loses the drama in the little squiggly lines. They become flatter. So you pick a handful of key questions. This is just the way every polygraph works. You pick a handful of really key questions, and those are the ones you concentrate on. So you have control questions, which are ones you say you tell him actually to tell the truth or to lie on a question so you can see how the lines go up and down. Then when you finish doing the control questions and you see how he reacts, that's when you get to the four or five really key questions, and those are the ones you really concentrate on. If you ask him more than that, then you lose the effectiveness of the exam. So, and John asked, do you think he'd take a polygraph on those other charges with his wife and, and son? And basically he wanted to. Um, yes, he, he, he said he wanted to. Because he felt like he could pass it. And then he could say, look, I passed a polygraph on this and try to use it as like evidence to the public. But in reality, um, it, you know, it can't be used for anything anyways. And a lot of people have questions like, uh, I took a polygraph once. Elizabeth said, it said I lied about my name along with everything else. Tina said, do you think the lie detector should be stopped? They basically are stopped for all intents and purposes. Um, they don't carry yeah, any significant weight unless you agree to something like this. Or law enforcement think? calls polygraphs tools. They don't really call it a definitive piece of evidence. And so what it is, it's a tool. It's a situation where you try to convince a person to tell you the truth by, look, I took a polygraph. You lied on the polygraph. So you might as well tell me the truth now. Right. They just use it as a tool during interrogations. For now, sure. you know, interesting thing to remember. Mm -hmm. You remember during the trial, one of Murdoch's uh, trials, he tried to get a polygraph put in that somebody else took mm -hmm. to show that they lied and it didn't come into evidence. Yeah, it was a guy that's, I mean, if there's a, if there's somebody that uh, can compete with Murdoch and telling stories that might not be true, it was that guy. It was cousin, cousin right. Eddie, I think his name was. Yeah. Um, so yeah, okay. So what other arguments uh, were made that you think we need to talk about? before we got the sentencing, why the prosecutors wanted to pull the plea agreement? Well, um, they, they said that he, again, he asked the, the questions about the prior crime. Uh, Murdoch wanted to get questions about that in the polygraph. He didn't do it. They also said, and again, I, this can be done. They didn't specify it, but you can gear questions to create falsity or create deception. And they say that he geared questions. He asked questions in certain ways to make sure that they would come up with deceptive answers. Now, I don't know the specifics of that. And they've, they have not released, the government did not release to the defense the specific polygraph or the questions. So I can't tell you what those questions were, but they claimed that they were deliberately geared to come up with deception. And another thing that he said in the beginning was that they said that he had just come from giving a polygraph to Vandersloot, who was right. accused of killing Natalie Holloway. Like very weird, very weird stuff happening at the beginning of it that the defense was basically saying he was un unprofessional, but it seems like he is the guy that does all these polygraphs for a lot of federal offices. Yeah, and I, and I, don't, I don't know him, uh, but the FBI has their own polygraphers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that they use. So I don't know who this specific guy was, but my guess is it's a federal case. It's an FBI case. They would have brought in the guy with the best credentials they could find uh, to do this case to make sure they didn't have any problems. And before we get to what he was actually sentenced to, the main thing that the prosecutors wanted to change when pulling this plea agreement is making the sentence go from concurrent to consecutive. Uh, explain why that would be such a big deal in this in this case. Okay. Well, the only real benefit in this in that plea agreement uh, to Murdoch was the fact that whatever sense he got in the federal case would go with his state uh, fraud case. So in state fraud case, he got uh, 27. 27 years yeah. so that this case, which, by the way, we, we haven't talked much about it, but the sentencing guideline 
in this case, we had a maximum of 22 years. Again, That's what we guidelines expected are, it to be around too. Oh, excuse me? We expected it to be around 22 years. Right. So that's the suggested sentence. Uh, it's not a mandatory 22, but it's suggested that there be a 22. So if you do that 22, if you take it to the 27 state, the 27 state was estimated to be about a 22 real time prison sentence. What he would actually do. The time he would do in prison, they would expect to be similar to the 22. So basically what they were trying to set up with this plea deal is if they were able to get the charges against Murdoch's wife and son that he was convicted of and sentenced to life. If they could get those overturned and to go away or they have another trial and they win and he's not guilty, that's what they're all pushing for. And if somehow by the slim chance that they were able to do that, Murdoch gets out in 22 ish years. That was right. what his defense attorneys were trying to do this entire time. They wanted him to serve it in club fed federal prison. That didn't happen. But even if he was going to serve it in state prison, they wanted this done in 22 years. So the prosecutors, thinking he lied, was trying to screw these victims again, lying about the $6 million, maybe some other people involved. They wanted to pull that and make him serve 22 plus 22 or 27 or whatever the federal number might have been, right? Right. So Which basically, is, they try to make it a wash. Basically, whatever his federal sentence was compared to a state sentence, it would really be, you know, nothing bad would happen to him in the federal sentence because he already had to serve the state sentence. And especially because 22 years plus 27 years is basically life for Alec Murdoch. So that's what they were trying to avoid is life in prison, whether or not those charges were overturned against his wife and son. Okay. So that leads us now into Michelle's question. I thought Creighton was bowing down when he made, when this deal came out, but now that this happened, I think maybe he knew Murdoch would hang himself. Well, Murdoch usually does, but maybe not for the reasons you're thinking. It turns out, they had a little meeting in chambers with the court. They discussed these issues and determined them to be a moot point. Now, why were they a moot point? That's important for us to get to. Because as we talk about the sentencing hearing, the state or the federal government asked for the court to sentence Alec Murdoch to 30 years. Not 22, not 27, 30 years. The court, taking that under advisement, ended up sentencing Alec Murdoch to 40 years in federal prison, above the guidelines of 22 years, even above what the federal government was asking for. But he sentenced it concurrently, meaning he can serve it at the same time as the 27-year state sentence. Now, 27 years, and Katie, this was your question, uh, It's they're going to be run concurrently, not consecutively, so that's a win for the defense, but it's 40 years, not 22, so that's a win for the prosecution, but under federal law, what do they do? Like 55, 54 days or something of time served. What is it? It's usually, they I think do, it's they like, do federal. It's, it's 85%. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. But it, I thought there was like a new thing. <clears throat> that, let me see. It's the, the good credit first step act. Yeah. I was looking oh, at it. I was act. looking at it a little bit for today. It's like 54 days, basically a year you can get taken off for time served. So basically Alec Murdoch is still looking at over 30 years in federal prison. So regardless of how you look at it, it's not going to be a wash. He's going to have more federal time than state time. How unusual is it for a federal judge to go above even what the federal prosecutors are asking for for a criminal defendant's sentence? It happens. It, it doesn't happen the majority of times, but it does happen where, where federal judges make decisions independent of the recommendation of the U.S. Attorney's Office. And um, under what so circumstances do they usually do that? Well, they usually do it when they're ju it just so it's, he's so offended by the crimes. Uh, in this case, this judge actually went through some of the crime. If you're, well, the defense lawyers tried to minimize it. They, they compared this um, to the crypto uh, sentencing yeah. uh, and they compared it SBF to or whatever his name is. He only got 25 years. Something he only like got that. 25. And they talked about what was the, the young lady that uh, Elizabeth um, Holmes. Yeah, Elizabeth Holmes sentencing, where she got 11 years, I think. Something like that. So they're yeah, they're comparing it to those, trying to show the judge this wasn't so bad. And the, the problem with that is, in those cases, people were investing money to make money. In this case, people actually died. Uh, you know, he was, you know, he had quadriplegics who he was stealing, stealing money from. Mm -hmm. He had state troopers who'd been shot who was stealing money. Worst from. of the worst, basically. Yeah. He was just doing just the most miserable thing to the, to the, to the weakest and most vulnerable parts of society. 
that the victims that he cheated were the most vulnerable people in society. The judge was just really, really offended by that. And, you know, you explained it. This judge was really smart because what he did is he eliminated an appellate issue. If he well, would have said, so let me, let me okay, phrase the question so people know what you're answering now. So right. why did this whole fight um, about he lied on the polygraph. We want to pull the plea agreement. We want to run them concurrent or consecutively, not concurrently. Why did that become a moot point? What did this judge do to protect everything basically from going on appeal um, based on the plea agreement? Well, yeah. In addition to all that, the defense lawyers were saying the prosecution planned this. They knew he was going to lie. Or the prosecutor apparently made some public statement that we were going to put him away for the rest of his life. So this was their intention all the time. So it was a big fraud. Well, the benefit to this fraud allegedly was this concurrent versus consecutive time. Well, if the judge eliminated the benefit that he was going to get or not get from the plea agreement, he eliminated the appellate issue. Uh, and let me kind of go, go into that a little bit. The appellate issue would have been if the judge had said, yes, the plea agreement is out. So now we can sentence to consecutive time. But what the judge said was, no, I'm not going to even rule on the plea agreement being out or in. And the judge did not rule on those issues. The judge just said, it's a moot point because I'm going to make a concurrent time, which is the benefit he would have gotten in the plea agreement. So what can you appeal now? How can you complain? He got the concurrent time. Now I'm giving him 40 years, but he got the concurrent time. And so there was no agreement on here in the plea agreement. It's always going to be up to the judge at the end. So basically, Murdoch still loses all the rights. The government still gets all the information that they got. They publicly got to call him a liar, which his defense attorneys were mad about that. Publicly, they called him a liar. Privately, they kept the, the entire polygraph under seal because there was information they said they shouldn't have to make public. So that was all not, not very good either for uh, Murdoch. Right. So, I mean, he, this judge was, was smart. Basically, outsmarted them both took away any issues and gave him 40 years. Um, Ashley asked, will the time be reduced for good behavior? Yes. Something between 85% or um, 54 days a year. Yeah, we're going to talk about, I see here some people saying what Jim Griffin said, which I think he may be off on, but we'll, it wasn't directly from him, so I don't want to quote him, but it's going to be in this. Um, we're going to jump to a little quick, just five-minute news video to see if they bring up anything else we want to talk about. Melstar said, I just don't understand what purpose of going after him after all these cases since he'll never get out anyway. Well, he still could. He's still appealing the conviction of the death of his wife and son. So if he were to win that, all of this would really matter. You know, keep in mind, too, you've got victims out there, people yeah. who he stole money from, like I said, the quadriplegic, whatever like that. Mm -hmm. Those people have to be satisfied as well. So not just the murder convictions, but you've got these people that were cheated. They deserve to have their, their crimes and have them sentenced for their crimes too. Bryce said, I don't know how SBF uh, from FTX steals 8 billion and gets 23 years. It's wild. It's wild. <laughs> uh, he also is not as, as long standing of bad decisions and screwing people like Alec Murdoch. There's a lot more money, but Murdoch has a lifelong uh, tendency of doing this. But all right, let's take a listen to this, this news report about his sentencing. There's a couple other things I want to discuss in it. Alec Murdoch will spend another 40 years in prison and pay another $8 million in restitution. Aaron, that's right. We have team coverage today with crews outside of the courthouse right now where some victims are speaking. And News 2's Riley Benson joining us live in studio, breaking down everything you need to know about the hearing and the events leading up to it. But first, we want to start listening into the courthouse where those victims are speaking now. It's funny because that is also Becky Hill's lawyer here that's going to speak for this victim. Um, but just what you said, Dad, and that's why I want to show some of the victims. This is the reason too, right? I mean, they deserve their day. They had it in state court as well, but... They were screwed by Alec Murdoch. So nobody, a plea deal is not wasting quite the time, resources, and money that a trial does. So they still get their justice without having to take all of that time for the trial, potentially like um, some commenters are saying, like, we've already got him convicted of the worst of the worst. Why do we need to do this? And this is one of the reasons why. You were involved in any way, shape, or form, and you're a culpable party, uh, whether it be to... Uh, my clients or, or someone else's clients or someone who is um, hiding in the shadows to you should be held accountable i mean i think that um the only way to help ensure this never happens again in our state particularly among the ranks of attorneys is for absolute 100 percent accountability and wherever that 
lands us is where it lands us. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. It's about all we got from them, but there's there's more more in the video. All right, hearing from Murdoch victim there, Pamela Pinckney. Riley's been following this very closely. He's got some more updates for us. Yeah, and Riley, Murdoch and federal prosecutors reached a plea deal on the charges last fall, but it seems like that was thrown out today. Yeah, good afternoon, Aaron and Megan. Let's talk about it. It's a lot to break down here. We know that Alec Murdoch will now have to serve four decades in federal prison and pay back just over $8.7 million to the victims he's charged from stealing from, one you just heard from there. One of the biggest questions, how would that time have to be served? We now know that it will be served concurrently with his ongoing 27-year state financial crime sentence he received last year. Now, heading into today's hearing, there were two major questions looming, including whether or not Judge Gergel would side with the prosecutors to throw out a previously agreed-upon plea deal between Murdoch and prosecutors, and how would Murdoch have to serve the time, the federal time, either concurrent or back-to-back. -back. Now that know that nearly $9 million of restitution will be split between Murdoch's law firm, Palmetto State Bank, Pamela Pinckney, Murdoch's insurance company, and other victims. Murdoch's 40-year sentence... I believe the Satterfields, Eric Bland's victims were not mentioned there, and he was not happy about that, but it's kind of a different discussion. ...sentence will run concurrent with the 27-year state financial crime sentence he received last fall, of which he would have been eligible for parole until having served nearly 22 years of it when he would have been 77 years old. These two sentences will only be triggered if the two life sentences Murdoch is serving for the murders of his wife and youngest son, Paul, are overturned, a process that's likely to take years to play out in court. Now, the U.S. Probation Office had re recommended Murdoch receive between 17 and 21 and a half years for the crimes he pled guilty to, but in an order break, Judge Gergel had indicated he was considering sentencing Murdoch for longer. And of course, we see that this morning with Judge Gergel sentencing him to 40 years, 480 months, in federal prison. Of course, this is a developing story that News 2's Raymond Owens, he was there. He'll have a look later on it coming up this afternoon, starting on News 2 at 4 o'clock. So to think about this was Judge Gurgel. It's a federal judge, not a judge we've seen at any of the state trials before or anything like that. Um, but so the probation recommended 17 to 21 years. The judge literally went more than double what the probation officer, the average of what the, or the median or mean of what the probation officer recommended, which is, and that's a lot. That's a big upward departure studio riley benson count on two all right thank you riley well we're going to go ahead and get back out to raymond owens who is live uh he was in the courthouse all morning he's got the latest for us absolutely hi raymond uh, yes a, a number of things were discussed in court today judge gurgles um only spent about an hour really um uh, going over this sentencing hearing, uh, they prosecutors talked about 11 victims, 11 other victims uh, who did not want to be identified and were not part uh, of the particular case. They just didn't want to be identified. The prosecutors say they had about $1.3 million they lost as well as part of this case. But again, they didn't want to be known and did not want to be a part of that. Prosecutors said they believe uh, there's still also about $6 million uh, that is unaccounted for by Alec Murdoch. Uh, they say that he claims that he used that money on drugs, but they say it's just not possible to spend that much money on drugs. They also talked about a polygraph uh, test that he tested. That so again, that's kind of one of the issues. It's like he must be lying because you couldn't spend that much money on drugs. How can you actually prove he's lying? Well, when it's their sole discretion and they can look at the polygraph and be like, ha look here. It looks like he's lying well, on the polygraph. You know what else? The, the judge did comment that you can't be this high on drugs all the time and do the sophisticated thefts you did for 20 years and hiding all this financial fraud that it's inconceivable that you could be high all that time. Which is exactly what we've been saying the yeah. entire time on this channel in the chat just seems impossible to be making this much money, doing this well in all your trials that everybody knows you as a world renowned, amazing lawyer for all these years. And you're taking enough pills that would like kill a horse. It's pretty wild, but that's his story and he's sticking to it. He uh, took and failed uh, with regard to that information. Uh, now, the judge did sentence Murdoch to 480 months. That's 40 years. The prosecution was only asking for 30 years, so the judge uh, definitely increased that sentence by stacking the charges, if you will. Uh, he said, in part, the judge said a number of things, but he said, quote, a serious sentence is necessary. There must be justice for his victims. Deterrence is critical in this case. If he were released, I believe he would continue in illegal activity. This sentence is intended to demonstrate serious consequences to attorneys. 
Again, that's a 40-year sentence, sentence, 480 months in prison. Uh, he also was ordered to pay mandatory restitution of $4,762,731.88. Judge Gergel uh, said that was basically um, something that was necessary in this case as well. Now, a lot of the victims have already been paid by insurance or even the law firm that uh, Murdoch worked for. Uh, so this money, if it is paid, uh, would go to, to cover some of that as well. Uh, now, Jim Griffin, uh, one of Murdoch's attorneys, came out right after uh, the sentencing hearing, and he talked about how the First Steps Act, the Federal First Steps Act, uh, if you look at that and how that is handled on a federal level, about 60% of the time, or about 60% of the sentence, uh, would be served in federal court. Uh, he said that's about what, or in federal prison, uh, he was saying that's about what Murdoch is already expected to serve in state court uh, prison. Uh, in the meantime, so that's the. So I could be completely wrong, right? And I, I've never heard sixty percent before. I've heard eighty-five percent, obviously, from you. And then I looked up the act, and it said fifty-four days. And guess what? Penthouse Bath Co. says the math is mathing. Fifty-four days is fifteen percent. So yes, eighty-five percent if it's a uh, good to, uh, good time or whatever, which is like thirty-four years of forty, not twenty-seven years, and definitely not twenty-two years. So if he was going to be 77, 22 years from now, 34 years would put him, what, 89? It's a much different life, being 77 well, and being 89. And 12 years is a long time to spend in prison. Um, so those additional years absolutely make a difference what this judge did. They absolutely make a difference. And I, again, I, I'm always, you know, have a chance of being wrong, but I don't think I am. Uh, I don't know what he's talking about, that he's going to serve 60% of this in federal prison. I, 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 so all I want to say is maybe there was a miscommunication between Griffin I, and the lawyer. Oh, okay, because maybe yeah. Griffin's just wrong. I don't know. The state, the, the jurisdiction that has the primary custody usually gets the prisoner back. In this case, the state had primary custody and the feds had a writ do a writ. It's called a writ uh, from state custody to federal custody for this. And when the case after the sentencing, they've got to return him back to state custody. So I, I'm not sure that that was accurately reported. Um, people ask, can't they appeal based on the sentencing guidelines? If not, what is it for? So I'll give my opinion, but you'll have a, a better answer, I'm sure. I mean, the sentencing guidelines are just a guideline where most cases that are like this case go in. But every case is a case-by-case -case basis, sentenced that way, based on the judge's experience, based on this individual, based on the victims, the crimes committed. And he looked at this case and said, this is much worse than your average case that fits into the guidelines. Therefore, we got to give a harsher sentence. There's a statute, 18 U.S.C. 3553. That statute is the one that says what judges take into consideration in doing a sentencing. Then we have the sentencing guidelines. The U.S. Supreme Court in a case called Apprendi said that the sentencing guidelines were just a guideline. Uh, you know, you don't have to follow those guidelines that there are other factors that can come into play. So judges have the discretion now to go outside the guidelines. Guidelines are presumptively correct. So a judge has to give a reason, which is why the judge in this case went through the victims and talked about how heinous these crimes were. And that's why they were able to go above the guidelines. Um, Bryce asked, how long did Bernie Madoff get? He got like 150 years or something, right? He got like- Long, whole long time. Forever. <laughs> Um, Autumn, is it a conflict of interest for Bamberg, who's the lawyer that represented that victim, to also be Becky Hill, who's the clerk of court's lawyer, um, also representing, you know, Becky Hill? So no, because that person's not a victim of Becky Hill. Becky Hill wasn't working on the trial where his client was a victim. These are all different people connected to different legs of Alec Murdoch, so I don't see any conflicts of interest or issues there. John said, should the court system remove polygraph tests? They seem to just mix up truth and the public, it's not truth. Assumptions are dangerous. I mean, they're pretty much removed from the court system. I think the point, point is, like, the feds could have said Alec Murdoch was lying even if there was no polygraph test, right? right. I mean, the state said it. A lot of people have said it. Um, and people can call you a liar with or without a polygraph test. And most people that know about polygraph tests, they know, you know, some of the issues and some of the, the good things, some of the bad things about them. So, um, you know, it kind of, they are what they are at this point, but they're not really a tool used in court very often. All right, I'm going to pull up this article that had some interesting parts. 
that I wanted to ask you about and discuss kind of about this. Um, talk about the 1.3 stolen money. The judge said this is a reprehensible crime that deserves the most serious of sanction. That's, you know, one of the reasons you go outside the sentencing guidelines. I am literally filled with sorrow, filled with guilt over the things I did. Murdoch said um, to the judge, which is not un unlike what we've heard him um, say before. Um, here's the quote about to publicly allow the government to accuse him of breaching his plea agreement and then hide all the purported evidence. Is it unusual that they would hide the results of polygraph test? I don't think they should. I, I think that if they're going to base something on that poly, if they're going to make a public announcement that the defense has the right to use it so that they can counter it. But because it's a grand part of a grand jury investigation and there may be grand jury evidence involved, they're allowed to keep it secret. Although, I, frankly, I don't think that's right. Uh, he told the court he's 937 days clean. He says his addiction contributed to you know his bad acts, which we know how the judge felt about that. Um, okay, those were just a couple of the, the quotes I wanted to get. Somebody else, there was something else here about the, oh, here is the act that Griffin referenced. The Good Conduct uh, for Time Credit Act under the First Step Act, and it very clearly says 54 days credit each year of the sentence imposed by the court, which happens to be 15%, which would make me think we're looking at 85% if everything goes for Alec Murdoch while he is in prison. Right? What it looks like to you as well? Oh, yeah. I mean, I suppose it's, it's 85%. I mean, that's the way I've always looked at it. Sorry? I've always looked at it as 85%. Uh, Care said they missed it concurrent or consecutive concurrent with the state charges, but it's concurrent with the state uh, financial crime charges. charges. Right. right, fraud charges, financial crime charges. So the 27 years, which will probably be more like 22 years of state, he's looking at 40 years, which will be more like 34 years in federal prison. But it is concurrent. Cheryl said, question, Peter, why is it they don't serve the full term? I don't care if they're good behavior or not. If they get sentenced to 40 years, why can they not serve 40 years? What do you think, Dad? Well, there's, there's some logic when you think about it. If you don't give them some incentive to be good while they're in prison, then why should they not just be a problem the whole time they're in prison and cause the guards problems and cause other people problems? Giving people an incentive to obey the rules and be good while you're in prison it is, when you think about it, there, there's a worthy uh, end game there so that when they get out, you know, they have spent their time in prison and they've been good while they're there. And Bodhi said, good time is one of the things I actually agree with. I do. And it makes sense, right? I mean, that's, I got to have a carrot basically to, to dangle. Um, Griffin said that in his press conference after court, the report got his quote, right. But it plus said they were discussing an appeal. Let me see if I, what are the chances of appeal now? with all the kind of shenanigans right at the end before the court sends it, I'm going to try to find that Griffin interview. The odds and appeal are pretty slim uh, because the judge, again, did away with all the issues with regards to that polygraph by giving him the concurrent time anyway. So he can't show where he was prejudiced by all this anymore. So, you know, he, he can appeal anything, but I think the odds of success on any of the appeals on the financial crimes are slim and none. Um, I'm looking up. If somebody has the Jim Griffin interview, send it my way. Let's take a look at, oh, here we go. All right. I got something. We got something. We got Boy, something. Fast. All right, that's Jim Griffin. That's one of his lawyers. He is, I think, more of the appellate guy. I think he was an assistant U.S. attorney um, representing him. Do any of the federal time under the First Steps Act that was passed by? Were to have to do any of the federal time under the First Steps Act that was passed by former President Donald Trump? Federal inmates now are doing approximately sixty percent of the time that they are sentenced, and so at sixty percent of forty years, that's twenty-four years. 
that's almost a, it's a little bit more than what he has remaining on the state court financial. Maybe it's new. If Trump just put it in, I've never heard it. I've never seen that before. Maybe it's new. Plus, plus he doesn't say he's going to serve the time in a federal facility. He just says that's his federal time. Uh, he still could serve it in the state facility. Okay. Sentence. So that's where we are. And um, will he appeal? I mean, I'll, I'll talk to him about that later today, but he's ready to move on and we're ready to move on, frankly. The latest in the saga, breaking news now, disgraced South Carolina attorney Alec Murdoch has just been sentenced to 40 years in prison on federal financial crime charges. News Nation's Brian Enton has been following this case, as we all have since the very beginning, the convoluted web of crimes that he is tied up in. Um, how does this impact his ongoing court cases and appeals, Brian? Yeah, it's, it's a good question because you kind of have to look at the big picture of this entire thing. And you heard his attorney, Jim Griffin, talking about it. They're appealing his murder conviction, Marnie. So what his defense attorneys are hoping, and it's a big if and it's a big hope, but if they can get him another trial on the murder charges, which, which is possible, and then get him acquitted, which is a long shot. But if that happens, then what would happen is he would then go now to federal prison. Uh, because you see, he just got the 40-year uh, sentence uh, on, the, feder on the, the federal crimes. Federal prison is a heck of a lot nicer than state uh, prison in South Carolina. So that's a win right there for Murdoch. Secondly, you just heard Jim Griffin say there's all these, these new programs when it comes to serving federal time. He could only serve 20 years of the 40-year sentence. People going to prison on financial crime, sometimes get out earlier on house arrest when it comes to, uh, to, to serving federal time. So um, the big plan here for them is if they can get him a new trial on the murder charges, get him off, which again, it's a big if, but if they do, then he heads to federal prison and might actually get out someday. Also hearing from prosecutors that he may have failed a polygraph test uh, recently that would have been part of his appeal or a plea deal. Anything more you, you're hearing on that? Yeah, well, listen, the, the plea deal, Marnie, what we thought he was going to get today was 17 and a half uh, to 22 years. The judge went much, much higher than that, 40 years. Uh, the polygraph may have something to do with that because part of the deal with the state was uh, you'll get this plea deal if you agree to a polygraph and you tell us the truth and you tell us if there was anyone else involved in these awful financial crimes where you stole from all of these innocent people. Uh, and, and I mean, one of the things is just in the in the plea agreements, usually you can't guarantee what a judge is going to sentence you to. Right. You can only guarantee what the probation office or whatever is going to give to the judge and the judge still makes the call. Uh, Chris. The judge asked, What's the difference between restitution in the Murdoch case and forfeiture in the SBF case? I didn't look into the SBF case at all, but what's the difference between restitution and forfeiture in federal court? Restitution means the person has to pay the money back somehow from any means possible. Forfeiture means they actually take assets, physically take the assets of the person and convert them in order to pay people back. So uh, Murdoch may not have any assets, but he's still going to owe the money forfeiture means that he's got assets and they're actually going to physically take his assets. That's, that's the difference. Shirley said 4,000 in the chat, only 1,000 likes. Hit that like button. I don't know if I said that off the top with my April Fool's joke, but yes, hit the like button if you guys haven't already. Make sure you subscribe to our page um, and hit that reminder bell so you don't miss any videos. People, or P.O. Uh, there might be prison reform during the time in prison that could affect his actual time, even if something is now practically a life sentence? No. How often does prison reform affect people that are currently in prison? It's unusual. Oh, it right? happens a lot. No, it does. Whenever there is um, some major prison reforms. But it's unusual normally... it's major prison reform is my <clears throat> Oh, yes, that's unusual. Yeah. But when they have had them, for instance, they changed the guideline on crack and powder cocaine uh, a few years ago. When they did that, all the people in prison that were sentenced under the crack cocaine guidelines got a benefit because they lowered the crack cocaine guidelines down to the powder. So a lot of those people actually got out earlier because they changed the guidelines. Um, that, that does happen. Well, just like John, in a good time, when you read the First Step Act, that's a prison reform. Uh, John said, didn't Alex's son, well, apparently I read it wrong. So 
Uh, didn't Alex son walk away with 500 K in Alex money before the money will be dispersed. Uh, if they can connect it back, then there's a way they can try to go after it. But I, I don't really know the details around this personally. Did you read anything on this? I didn't, no. I didn't see this personally. I don't know. And what we're hearing is that he failed the polygraph. So he may not have been telling the truth when they were asking him whether anyone else involved. Maybe that's the reason it went from 17 and a half to 22 years all the way up now to the sentence uh, of 40 years. Yeah, just another case where the judge is throwing the book at him, the money and the restitution. I mean, we're into the millions of dollars and the question being, yeah. where did the money go and does he have it to pay back? What are his attorneys saying about that, Brian? Well, they're saying he's come clean uh, with, with telling them where all the money is, that he's told them everyone who was involved. Part of this 40-year sentence is he also has to pay uh, $9 million in restitution. Where that money is going to come from, I mean, they sold Moselle. There's a couple of other things to sell. I'm not sure there's $9 million there, but you think of these victims. The judge says he sentenced him to 40 years. This is what the judge said a little while ago, because Murdoch stole from the most needy, vulnerable people. And let me remind you, Marnie, who some of these victims are. Children's, uh, children whose parents died in car crashes, a state trooper injured on the job, a man who became a quadriplegic after an accident. These are people who went to Alec Murdoch and his law firm for help because they were in awful accidents and they had to sue. And then Murdoch stole their money. Um, so it really is reprehensible what he did. And the judge, the judge seems to uh, have agreed with that now with this 40 year sentence. Thank you for watching. All right. So I think we got the gist. What, what were you going to say? I was just going to say the polygraph had nothing to do with the sentence that he got the 40 years. And the reason I say that is the judge was very careful to state the reasons why he gave him the 40 years. And the reason you say that is because an appellate court may look at it in the future. And he didn't say anything about the polygraph affecting his decision of the 40 years. <clears throat> and I think he did that deliberately to eliminate that polygraph being an appellate issue for the sentencing. Yeah. And I, I agree. I think that's the point is you want to stick to the law, the law, the legal reasons why you can have a upward right. departure. Um, and that's really what he was focusing on. Somebody saying I wasn't paying attention. I was trying to see if there was any other Jim Griffin interviews, but I think we can call it there with that one. We got the gist of what he was saying. I have to look up that 60% versus 80%. I, maybe it's something to do with like when you're serving state and federal at the same time, I know it's something that you do have to actually um, like qualify for. So I, I don't know. Um, I'm out of the criminal game anyway. I'm out of it. Uh, so I don't necessarily need to know except for YouTube, I guess. There, there are there are special programs uh, that can reduce your sentence. Like there, there's a drug rehab program in federal system that can reduce your sentence. I mean, I don't know if he's talking about those special programs. Maybe he is. Maybe he's saying that maybe if we stacked all these special programs, it comes out to 60%. But the, the right now, going in without a special program, I think that all we've got is the 85%. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not positive. But I also saw some people asking what trial is next coming up. Chad Daybell, jury, sent, or jury selection started today. It's supposed to last a week or two. And that um, trial is supposed to last eight to 10 weeks over in Idaho. So we will definitely be covering that. Not every day, but every couple of days, giving updates on that. We'll continue to follow the P. Diddy case. Um, we'll continue to follow Murdaugh as stuff continues to happen with this. There was some Coburger stuff um, where they talked about, I don't know if you saw that, the defense was reaching out to prospective jurors, got accused of jury tampering. Maybe we'll talk about that on a future video. That case is kind of nonstop as well. But I appreciate you guys joining. As always, Dad, thanks for coming on. Uh, make sure everybody hits the like button if you guys haven't already. We'll continue to follow all of the cases you guys are interested in. So make sure you subscribe, make sure you hit me up on other social media platforms to send me videos, cases, documents that you want broken down, questions you want answered, and we will continue to bring the content for you. So that's all we got this time. Till next time. Yes, Sarah Boone next month, hopefully. But until next time, for real now, we're out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. 
And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know. <laughs>